I welcome Dr. Janani Shankar. I know Dr. Janani Shankar. She is my college mate, the most active pediatrician and very hardworking. I have seen her attending all the classes in ICH, out of time also. And child trust cannot be without Janani and Janani cannot be without child trust. She has seen the child trust grow. Thank you. And uh, she is a very senior consultant now and very confident. She has 65 indexed journals and she has authored five books. She has won all the Tamil Nadu state awards. She is currently the uh, she is holding a position in the central IAP. Over to Dr. Janan. Thank you. Thank you, Santa Lakshmi, for those nice words of introduction. I know all of you are in the postprandial state. I will not stand between you for more than 15 minutes. So the topic that was given to me was interpretation of investigations based on the clinical background. In the beginning, I did not understand what exactly I was supposed to talk, but I have just put my thoughts together and I will be discussing only case scenarios. So um, many of you are practicing uh, pediatricians or you are attached to a tertiary care hospital or you are having your own nursing homes. You know that the presenting complaint of any patient when they enter your office is not my child is having fever, my child is having loose stools, vomiting gone or those days when they start narrating their symptoms. They just tell that my child has got dengue, my child's platelet count is low, my child has got typhoid, that's what they all say and they all also show you lab reports. So first thing is they just tell, uh, show you uh, lab reports or files so from different hospitals and labs or the other difficult part is they hand over the mobile phone to you and they ask you to scroll through the reports, it's very very difficult, you'll have to expand look at it and then you have to go to the next page and you have to again expand and see so it's very difficult sometimes when you have uh, I mean visual uh, problems it's difficult you may even miss a positive as negative or a negative as positive and the platelet counts cannot be misinterpreted also so uh, this is the scenario current scenario with this I think we have to be having a very very strong clinical knowledge to decide what exactly the child has before we decide on managing the child. Moving on to case scenario 1, 3 months old child admitted for noisy breathing and poor feeding with a total count is 26,000 neutrophils predominant. Clinically, it's a well-nourished infant with minimal subcostal intercostal retractions, bilateral conducted sounds and the saturation in room air is 90%. This is the x-ray, there are some uh, peribronchial infiltrates, it is, so does this child need antibiotics? You saw that the child came in with some uh, difficulty in breathing and the plural count was 26,000 and this is the x-ray. Will anyone of you label it as a pneumonia and start this child on antibiotics? No, this child has bronchiolitis, there is no need for antibiotics and the high counts in this child was due to hypoxia. This is a very, very common scenario in the uh, emergency department. The students admit the child, will start on oxygen and they'll do a blood count and they'll call and say, ma'am, the count is 30,000. Shall I send blood culture and start on septraxone? Very small infant, ma'am. I am scared of sepsis. So this happens always. But if you are confident that the baby is otherwise well, there is no fever, you have made a clinical diagnosis of bronchiolitis, you don't have to start on antibiotics. So here you use your clinical judgment to um, disprove the lab that is showing a high total count. Moving on to the next case scenario. One year old high grade intermittent fever of four days duration. No identified focus of infection when you examine the child clinically. Total count shows uh, high count again 23,000 poly predominant, hemoglobin is 8.5, platelet count is 4.5 lakhs, urine routine shows 10 to 15 pulse cells and so the again uh, you send the urine culture, so how many of you would start this child on antibiotics? It's not wrong in starting this child on antibiotics pending the urine culture. So. This child's urine culture comes sterile, do we still label this child as UTI? So this child has got sterile pyuria. A relook into the clinical examination shows conjunctival congestion and BCG scar redness, which is again a clinical um, finding which you should never forget to look for in an infant with 
high grade fever without localizing signs with high total count and uh, sterile pyuria so the final diagnosis was kawasaki disease so one instance which is um, treated as culture negative uti or urosepsis culture they don't bother about the culture they just treat the child and the child improves because even kawasaki is a very self limiting disease they improve but what happens to the coronary damage if it all it happens so later on this child can have problems so this is one a message that i want to give please never never label these children as culture negative uti or uh, urosepsis without a positive blood i mean urine culture report go back and look at the clinical uh, findings and even uh, you can even do an echo if you have a doubt on these children moving on to the next case a 4 year old with fever of 6 days puffy eyelids mildly tachypneic abdomen is distended soft hepatomegaly this is the scenario we see day in and day out for the last 3 months total count is 7800 hemoglobin is 9 pcv is 30 platelet count is 66000 what are we dealing with there is no hemoconcentration So if you look at the history it looks like puffy eyelids mildly tachypneic definitely it looks like dengue with third spacing but what is against dengue a pcv should be high when there is third spacing active third spacing can never occur with a low pcv of course if the child has been managed with a lot of fluids outside this can happen but the platelet count is still low once the pcv improves the platelet count should parallelly improve so is it dengue fever is it dengue like viral illness or is it scrub typhus scrub typhus is another one which greatly mimics dengue fever the fever never subsides it goes on unless and until you start the child on doxycycline doesn't respond to other conventional antibiotics if you are uh, lucky you can pick up a eshkar so peripheral smear of this child shows clumping of platelets so the plate the thrombocytopenia what you had in the counter value as 66000 was just a pseudo thrombocytopenia again this is another clinical i mean lab clue that tells you that it is scrub typhus scrub typhus typically there is clumping and there is a pseudo thrombocytopenia moving on to the next case a 12 year old diagnosed as sle 2 months back on hcq and steroids presented with high grade fever of one week duration this is again a common scenario they uh, they come back to you during this tropical uh, season they can come to you with fever so you do the blood counts because she is immunosuppressed you don't want to take a chance total count is 4200 poly predominant hemoglobin is 9.5 platelet count is 1.8 lakhs esr is 80 and crp is 100 so how many of you think it is reactivation of the disease or whether it is intercurrent infection what is the clue from the lab that tells you it is an intercurrent infection and not a disease reactivation anyone from the audience yeah the positive crp tells you that it is inter intercurrent infection and not disease reactivation so again this is a very very good lab clue which helps you to correlate clinically so disease reactivation crp should be negative intercurrent infection crp will become positive focus of infection once you get a positive crp you have to really try and search and find out the focus of infection and antibiotics have to be initiated after sending blood culture it's a very very important message because children on immuno not only to sle children with malignancies children with immunosuppressive therapy who come in with fevers during this season you will have to be little more careful and just not sending them off as viral fever so please take some more time to ex examine them and find out the focus of infection of course the crp applies for children with sle coming to the case scenario 5 a 14 year old adolescent boy diagnosed as juvenile idiopathic arthritis on weekly methotrexate presents with high grade fever of one week duration again this is again a clinical uh, dilemma for you so total count is 24000 p the differential count shows poly predominant esr is 10 and crp is 126 so again there is a clinical clue here is it intercurrent infection is it disease reactivation is it a complication of jia so if it is intercurrent infection the esr also has to go up parallelly if it is a disease reactivation again the esr has to go up when the crp is so high the esr cannot remain as 10 so it is a complication of G J I A. So high counts with high CRP and a low ESR indicates 
macrophage activation syndrome which is a complication of jia again it's a medical emergency these children can just become very sick over a period of 12 to 24 hours in front of your eyes these children need intensive care unit care continuous monitoring and they have to be initiated on immunotherapy like ivig and sometimes even the next line has to be initiated again this is one condition where you have to be very very careful in interpreting the labs with the clinical condition moving on to the next case scenario the five year old girl high grade fever of one week vomiting and loose stools generalized maculopapular rash over the face and trunk has a cervical adenopathy looking to the clinical condition i think all of us will make a diagnosis of viral illness because there is fever there is vomiting there is loose stools there is rash and there is a cervical adenopathy so total count comes as 17500 with poly predominant platelet count is 1.6 lakhs crp is 128 esr is 90 and chest x ray is normal so again this is little confusing no so we normally expect if you think of viral there should be more of a lymphocytosis and a eosinophilia but here there is no eosinophilia and the lymphopenia is there and yes uh, crp and esr are very high is it imn is it misc again i think misc um, we have had enough talk about misc enough papers in the morning about misc my plea to this audience is do not over diagnose or under diagnose misc both are bad if you over diagnose you end up giving plasma products pool plasma products to children which are very expensive and which have their own side effects biologicals and plasma products which have their own side effects don't jump and do an antibody and if it is positive don't jump and give ivig and mps and shift them to icu and do that at the same time do not dump them as viral or imn and order an i um, ebv igm and reassure them and send them because this happened in our own hospital this child was seen as outpatient and because we have all forgotten covid and forgotten misc in the last two months it is filled with age dengue and scrub typhus and viral pneumonias and bronchiolitis misc has taken a lower down place in our minds and hearts so this child was reassured and sent with an ebv igm to be done as op came back 24 hours later not even 24 hours maybe 12 hours later in a state of shock so this child had a shock and it was a cardiogenic shock and it was misc ebv igm was negative so both ways we have to be very careful neither over diagnose nor under diagnose similarly ch children with uh, misc have been dumped as appendicitis and children with appendicitis have been dumped as misc both has happened again that is a message to all of you many of them come with severe abdominal pain vomiting loose stools and they can mimic appendicitis like what we used to do the teaching during dengue season any child comes with abdominal pain do not refer to the surgeon until and unless you order a blood count similarly do not forget misc which can mimic appendicitis that is another message that i want to give this audience so again don't chase the labs don't look at the labs don't look at pages and pages of reports many of the patients will have at least 3 or 4 platelet counts for a two day fever morning and evening every day two every two hours again the the panic in the pa parents mind cannot be uh, removed by us it's it's the media and it's the other source from where they get they'll be having bottles of thrombobliss and cariplis or whatever so please please pay attention to the clinic history is very very important many of these uh, dengue shock they forget the history of fever because after the fever the child develops complications they come uh, if you probe and ask they'll say the child had fever we had one instance where the child came with acute abdominal right iliac fossa pain and vomiting and when we put him down and examined we also made a diagnosis of appendicitis this is way back uh, pre covid pre uh, misc era so we made a diagnosis of appendicitis. so what happened was they had a big bunch of lab reports with them we just went through the lab reports casually and we found a cpk which was very high you wondering what is this why cpk was done for this child then we asked the mother did the child have fever about 3 or 4 days back the mother said yes he had fever fever settled now he has abdominal pain and vomiting 
So it was dengue. His PCV was 50. This is again a clinic. I mean, I should have put that case also. Somehow I missed it. I, I mean, I'm happy that I remembered at least now. So PCV was 50 for this boy and he was immediately rushed to the emergency and fluids was given. So again, these children who come with abdominal pain and vomiting, parents will never give importance to the fever because that is a forgotten thing for them. Fever is gone and afebrile period when they go into shock, they forget the fever. So please, as clinicians, it is our duty to ask them for a history of fever before we label them as appendicitis or MISC. Thanks. Thanks to the uh, organizers for the opportunity. <laughs>